patience to read, patience to read and read, and then write and rewrite. And this is what I would advise young Somalis to. Um, there is a young Somali writer, young in the sense of he's younger than I am, called Weberi, and he's from Djibouti. He's an excellent, excellent writer. He writes in French. And there, are, there is a young woman, also Somali, whose name is uh, Ubah Christine uh, Farah. She shares the same last name, uh, no relation, who writes in Italian, and she writes absolutely fantastically. Mm. And then there is a young Somali whom I met recently when I was in Nairobi, who showed me a novel, and he's called, he's called Abdi Goulet, and who's also an excellent, excellent writer, short stories, and he has written a novel. But you know, it's a, it's a long marathon journey writing, and uh, it's, I'm quite sure some of them will become prominent, more prominent than I, I hope. Uh, someone asked about the change from a personal spiritual Islam to a politicized Islam, and how that change may have had an impact on you individually and on your writing, or on Somalia itself, that's moved from a more spiritual, personal Islam to a more politicized Islam. Well, the politicized Islam comes, uh, has come into Somalia in the late, in the early 80s, I would say. It came into Somalia in the early 80s, and it's no wonder it coincided with the period when Somalia was economically becoming more and more dependent on other nations. As you may remember, some of you may remember, Somalia and Ethiopia were involved in a war that accounted for about a million dead in the mid-70s, 77, 78. And from then on, Somalia became dependent on foreign aid. It was during that time that Siad Barre, the dictator who at one point uh, said, was said to have sentenced me to death or uh, and whose ire, I, whose anger, I, I somehow uh, arose. Now, spiritual Islam. Somalis used to be more Sufi of the Sufi tendency. I don't know if you know the expression where mysticism and the idea of the Quran as redemption, as you know, communication with God and very personalized way of spiritual fulfillment and all this. This used to be the tradition in Somalia until the late 70s and early 80s when Wahhabism that comes from Saudi Arabia entered the Somali Peninsula. And it entered through teachings that came from Saudi Arabia that propagated the politicization of Islam. Now, prior to the early 80s, the majority of the Islamic instruct instructors came from Egypt where there is also an element of Sufism, where there is more tolerance of other religions and other faiths. And then, with the rise of Wahhabism in Somalia, you came then, you came to see more and more people's dressing habits also changed. In Somalia, we didn't have veils before. A woman would wear, would cover her head decently, in the same way as I would think, um, you know, a venerable Italian, a Sicilian woman would also do that or when going to church, when going out. One would do that out of respect, you know, cover their 
their heads and they would wear sh some kind of a shawl covering their heads. And that was the Somali tradition, not this Afghan style covering of, of the purdah. Now, because again in the 80s, when more and more Somalis lost jobs inside Somalia and then had to go and work in Saudi Arabia to earn you know, their stipend, because Somalia could no longer afford to hire most of its educated people, more and more Somalis came back wearing veils of the Afghani or the Saudi type. And then gradually, personalized, personal Sufi type of Islam gave way to politicized Islam until this culminated in Somalia becoming more and more fundamentalist more and more Somalis uh, of the fundamentalist kind, the radical kind. And it is this that made it possible for the Islamic courts in Somalia mm. to benefit from the chaos that took place and then eventually to take the reign of power. Unfortunately, unfortunately for, all, for everyone concerned, although the Islamic courts folks have done very well in so far as a number of things go. The problem was that um, they seem to have angered the West. They seem to have, um, you know, propagated a radical Islam that upsets many, many of Somalia's neighbors. And so they have recently been been ousted, and the, we are now paying for the consequences of politicized Islam being ousted. And the reason is because every day in Mogadishu nowadays you hear of bombs exploding, of people being killed, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our time, and, and we have time for one more question. And I would love if you would just describe to me something you think is incredibly beautiful in Somalia, something you remember as a young person perhaps, something that you looked at and thought, I am going to write about my country. I'm going to keep my country alive by writing about it. Well, I would say that everything about Somalia when I was growing up was beautiful and has remained beautiful in my memory. And therefore, that's why I've continued writing about it. And also because no one else writes about it. And that's why I've, I continue writing about it. That's why I love it, because nobody loves it anymore. Because it's been, you know, we've been through lots of civil war, and lots of people are running away from it. You know, people don't like to associate themselves with an idea that has been defeated. Somali, the notion of Somaliness is a notion that some of the Somalis are taking their distance from. And the reason is because it is associated with failure. Whereas I say, well, you know, there is a momentary failure, but we are going to rise. And that's why I continue writing about it. And because I love it. There is no other country that I, I have not written about any other country. I have lived in Somalia, I have not lived in Somalia for many, many years. But I have never, ever written about any other country, any country other than Somalia. Which, and I will continue to write about it. Thank you. Thank you. Our thanks to Nuradine Farah, Somali writer, whose newest books here in the States are Sardines, Closed Sesame, and Sweet and Sour Milk, as well as Not. We thank our audiences here and on the radio. Thank you also to the Bernard Osher Foundation for its generous support of the Commonwealth Club Goodlit Programming. I'm Jewel Gomez, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating more than a century of enlightened discussions, is adjourned. <laughs>